today, the task of activism is to build a bridge to those that don't agree with us. And it's our responsibility to harness the creativity and the skill to help people walk across onto the side of decency, inclusivity, anti-racism, and a fair and just economic system that protects our climate. You're listening to Climate Curious, a podcast for people who care about the world but find the current conversation about climate change confusing, boring, or scary. My name is Marion Pasha, and I'm the director and curator at Telex London and co-host of this podcast, along with the amazing Ben Hurst. Say hello, Ben. Hey there, friends. I'm Ben Hurst, activist and advocate exploring what positive masculinities can look like, humble model, and climate normie. Hello, friends. Hello. We are back <laughs> with a second installment of our two-part series with main character, main character energy in the room, yeah. Kumi Naidu. Yeah. If you haven't listened to part one, pause, scroll back and listen to part one. But if not... Sit back, relax and prepare for another masterclass in activism, intersectionality and climate. From the former International Executive Director of Greenpeace International and the Secretary General of Amnesty International. Okay, so here it goes. Let's dive right in where we left off. Like how did a, a, a kid who grew up in apartheid South Africa and was a, a anti-apartheid activist at 15 years old end up on a rubber dinghy in the Arctic <laughs> floating around working for Greenpeace and then for Amnesty and like what is the, what is the path or what was the path for you and why do you care? Like why, what is, why is it that you care about the climate crisis as an issue? Um, and I guess also within the context of like you cared 10 years ago when it wasn't popular to care about this. So more like why at that point did it stand out to you as something that was urgent or something that was important? How did you get to that space? So when I was appointed the head of uh, Greenpeace and the first week, I had to do lots of media interviews and irrespective of whether it was journalists from rich countries or poor countries, they were all asking me the same question, the same dumb question, might I add. <laughs> right. Where they said, oh, you, so you're leaving poverty and human rights and you're going to the environment. And I said, you know, the struggle to address poverty, human rights on the one hand and gender equality and so on on the one hand and the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change and to ensure that we don't destroy our ecological integrity must, can, and should be seen as two sides of the same coin, right? The fact that, and, and this is also one of the problems of our civil society as evolved over time, right? Because we can criticize our governments of not operating in an intersectional way and all of that and operating in line ministries and, and silos and all of that. But we have also, right, fallen into that same trap, right? Because I can tell you, in the environmental movement, there were lots of people who said, you know, even when I was at uh, Greenpeace, I once there was a indigenous woman from Canada who died under mysterious circumstances, right? And a family were convinced, right, that she was, she, there's no way she would have committed suicide. And there's lots of indigenous First Nations uh, women in Canada that were dying under mysterious circumstances. And so, and the person, it was a very close colleague of mine, right? It was her sister. And, uh, and so when I saw it on her Facebook page, I put it on my Facebook page and I get attacked, right? For why are you bringing human rights and, and this and that into it? Why are you not sticking to environmentalism? Oh. Uh, you know, so I was getting that you know, from people who were in positions, uh, you know, not necessarily full-time paid positions, but, but, uh, you know, like sort of, uh, volunteers in, uh, which, which I, by the way, I consider the volunteers in every movement, the most precious parts of our movements. Yeah. Right. They're the life. They are the lifeblood and the backbone yeah. of our movements. Right. So therefore I would like, be more affected almost when a volunteer <laughs> were to like attack me that way. So, so there's a lot as shifted, 
right? A lot has shifted from that moment when I started in 2009 in, in Greenpeace. It was very late for it to start shifting to where we are, but it's nowhere near where we need to be to make the intersectional connections between all these di different struggles are connected. And I hope that leadership in all these institutions now will do much better than I did in terms of trying to push for much more intersectionality than, than we have in the world today. How do you see the intersection of climate change and human rights? So if we say water is a human right, okay? If we say water is a human right, that everybody should have access to clean drinking water, as well as water to cook food and for sanitation and so on, right? Uh, by the way, you know, it's very, uh, one of the things I do now is I, I'm on the Global Leadership Council of a multi-stakeholder initiative of governments, World Bank, IMF, civil society, uh, business sector, and all called Water and Sanitation for All. And, and I think part of the problem that we have not succeeded is that we are not willing to say things as crudely as we need to say it, right? Because like sanitation is like a really nice middle class word where we all yeah, say no one knows what sanitation is. <laughs> is a very big problem. We need to address it. And, you know, almost half the people in the world don't have decent sanitation. I mean, sanitation as a problem simply means that almost half the people in the world don't have a decent, safe place to piss and shit, right? That's what sanitation means, right? And so anyway, uh, and when I look at uh, the centrality of water for human existence, right? You know, there's a, there was a Cree leader from North America who said only when the last tree has been cut, the last fish has been caught, the last river has been polluted, would, you know, humanity realize they cannot, the, the, the last waters have been polluted, will humanity realize that we cannot eat money, right? And, and so, so right now, uh, people need to understand, and this is the failing of the environmental movement historically, that we did not humanize those environmental demands, right? So we made it sound as if environmentalism is about those people like animals, trees, and nature, right? But we have to understand we ourselves are part of nature as you, the human species, right? We have tried to dominate nature and, and over-dominate it. And that's why we are in such a deep crisis. But if you take water as something we need for human survival critically, right? If I give you an example, Cape Town, one of the most important cities in, in, in South Africa. You know, a couple of years ago, we were looking at running out of water. Right now in Port Elizabeth, another big city near to, not far from where Mandela grew up, they are facing water running out and so on. So people need to understand that the climate crisis is about water. It's about food. Also, you know, let's put it this way, right? I think the slogan, save the planet, save the environment, save the climate is not helpful, right? Uh, quite frankly, I don't, I don't believe the planet needs any saving. I think the planet is just fine, right? Why do I say that? If you continue on this, path that we're on, we continue to warm up the planet, we continue to, to destroy our water uh, resources, we continue to destroy our soil, and understand we are destroying soil on such a massive basis, and we need soil to grow food. Right? Yes, it's pretty important. And we need water to grow food, right? So if you continue on this path, and, and in parts of Africa and Asia and so on, where, you know, like, you know, what we say in Africa, you know, we are hot to start with. You know, yeah. <laughs> we'll be hot in lots of ways, you know, music, dancing, culture, and it's also now become really hot, right? Yeah. And what is happening is that we are seeing crops drying, dying because the heat is too much and so on. So given all of that, what's the end result? The end result is we don't have water, we don't have food, we will be gone. The planet will still be, and the good news for everybody who's concerned about the planet is, once we become extinct as a species, the forests will recover, 
the oceans will replenish and so on. So let's understand the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is nothing more and nothing less than protecting our children and their children's futures. And unless we can articulate that through cultural forms, through popular conversations and so on, urgently, much better than we've been able to do it up to now, we will not be able to in a very short time say, to make the changes that we need. And that is why for whoever's listening to this podcast, who plays a guitar, who sings a song, who writes poetry, who has the capability to communicate with people, who are not and can communicate with people in the language and the imagery that people understand, you need to understand you are much, much more powerful than a Kumi Naidu or the head of any big organization that does not know how to sing and dance properly. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> those individuals have the ability to change people's minds, to to educate people at mass, at large, like to to change the attitudes and the perceptions of of the issue. And like you say, that's that's so true, right? Like I've I've been watching, I've fallen into this hole recently on YouTube where I'm watching like loads of weird science videos and there's stuff about like oh what happened two minutes after the meteor hit the planet however many hundreds of thousands of years ago um and like the the world the earth does just recover doesn't it like it is literally we're literally talking when we talk about climate we're literally talking about the survival of people or people absolutely. being wiped out absolutely yeah. absolutely and the struggle of to avert catastrophic climate change is exactly what you said uh ben it's about whether humanity can continue to exist on this planet, right? And thankfully, we have all the technological knowledge. We have what we're lacking is political will. And the good news is political will is a renewable resource in many, many, <laughs> in many places around the world. Not, not, not in, not in every place around the world, but in many places around the world, it is a renewable so resource. And I hope voters will renew that resource and bring into power in whatever elections are ahead of us now, people who are committed to addressing the environmental collapse and the climate uh, challenges we face, but in a way that addresses deep levels of economic inequality on the one end and, uh, and, and the historical injustices of systemic racism. I want to, I want to ask you a question about because we've talked about this idea of it come the the the, the grass like grassroots people this that this is a i guess we've seen the rise of two really big movements around kind of climate activism and around black lives matter and i guess i want to ask you how do you see a movement like Extin extinction rebellion and a movement like black lives matter what do they have in common how could they work together? Like, what's your vision for those kinds of movements that have really inspired and, and mobilized groups of people for the first time in a while? I think it's uh, a critically important intersection and it's a critically important alliance to be built, right? I think that um, the... Um, message of Extinction Rebellion is absolutely spot on. It is saying we are facing extinction, extinction as a species, right? And we need to rebel against the path that we're on. And even if people don't agree with every single strategy and tactic that Extinction Rebellion uses and deploys, I believe that their message is sound and is one of the few movements that reflects the urgency of the moment we find ourselves in. There are shortcomings in terms of racial diversity, northern, stronger in the north, very weak in, in developing countries and so on. But to be fair to Extinction Rebellion, if the international NGOs, which have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars resources, are still after 40, 60 years, are still de dealing with diversity, inclusion and equity, uh, let's cut Extinction Rebellion a little bit of slack and let's hope that they can build that alliance with Black Lives Matters and, and others. Um, so, and, and I know 
that there are efforts and I have contributed to it. Uh, uh, yeah. So I facilitated a conversation between two of the founders of Extinction Rebellion and BLM. Uh, and, and, and even though they had not met each other, right? Joshua Verasani and Claire Farrell, even they had not met each other before, they found, and, and they will, might have been a little bit anxious, but they found common ground very, very quickly in conversation because they can see that they absolutely, uh, both agendas can be both move forward if they can find the connection. As, as it happened already, no, 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 I wouldn't want to overstate it. But people are looking to make those connections. And I appeal to people in leadership in both these movements to do everything they can to build the maximum level of unity amongst themselves as well as with a range of others. That is not to say that there's no contradictions between these institution, uh, these movements, there will always be, right? But the maturity that is called for in activism right now is whether we can focus on the substantial numbers of things that unite us and agree to respectfully disagree on the smaller number of things where we disagree and to create spaces for us to continue to have conversations about the things where we disagree. Yeah, it's always seemed to me that it's most convenient for people who hold power if we can stay siloed. Because then there's less power, momentum, numbers. The more we, the more we're separated into our own issues away from others, it creates more opportunities for the status quo to continue. Absolutely. And you folks sitting in Britain know that better than most of us because Britain gave the world divide and rule as a core strategy of control through colonialism. And that's basically it. It's a divide yes. and rule strategy, basically. I, I have two, Kubi, that I want to ask you um, that uh, might seem a little bit off, like from nowhere, but they're things that just are really pushing to the forefront of my mind. One of them is you know, there is this global north and south div like divide where you know, we've, which we've talked about and mentioned a few times around the p seats of power always being focused in the global north and and and, and all the things you've said. I, I don't want to repeat them, but I think as a person of color, I don't know. I I feel like I'm caught, and as someone from the global north, I feel caught between this discussion, in that I feel. Like I neither can absolutely rightfully speak for people who do live in any, you know, parts of the world that are not the North. And I also am not part of the kind of the system here. You obviously work with so many people. I'm just curious to know how you've seen people sit with that and not have it be something that actually shuts them down. Yeah, this is such a, uh important question, Mariam. L let me just say that I'm often saying to friends and colleagues in the South, listen guys, what we're dealing with is a geography lottery, right? You guys didn't decide to be born there and I didn't decide to be born here, right? Uh, people don't decide to be born rich or poor or even in terms of our gender or religion or whatever, right? But it's what we do and how we deal with it that's important. So I say, like, you know, we never should, as people from the global south, sort of feel that we got a chip on our shoulders and, you know, like we the dudes, the biggest attitudes because we're suffering so much and the people in the north. Because, like, 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 like let me just say, right, even if we talk amongst us here now, right, you guys have, you know, I'm an old bloke compared to you all, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, but you all are so much more powerful than I am, right? By virtue of the passport that you carry, right? You can forget COVID for a moment. I was going to say right? past tense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can jump on a plane and come into my country tomorrow if work needs to bring you here. As Secretary General of Amnesty, as head of Greenpeace, that was never a possibility for me, right? Because if I wrote a sort of self-reflection of just the funny incidents I had to deal with 
you know, at, 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 at Amnesty and Greenpeace during my time and, and, and before that Civicus, I probably will call it visas fucking visas, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, you can laugh, but it was not so, it's not so funny. Yeah, it wasn't funny at the time. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I intended it to be light. But, but, but you see, let's take that issue. That issue there, when I'm sitting with you all, I can't blame you all for it. It's a historical injustice that has developed over time. All I'm, all the folks from the global south are saying, when we sit around the table, let's not pretend like the power dynamics are not there, right? Let's acknowledge that we have differences and let's put it on the table, deal with it as mature, uh, in a mature way. And don't like just pretend, oh, just because we work in the same organization or in the same movement, there are no issues, right? So what I would say, Mariam, you don't need to be apologetic. Nobody should have to be apologetic about where they were born, what class location they find themselves, what race they are, and so on. Absolutely not. But if people are in denial about their power, just as it will be wrong for men today to deny the disproportionate power we have in the world, similarly, it would be wrong for a northern person who is from a G8 country, who's a citizen of that country. Because, I mean, let's take things right now, right? Have you guys been vaccinated? I've, yeah, I've had one. Right. And you've had two, Mariam. I am 56 years old, right? And there's been no possibility for me to get vaccinated. Right? Oh my gosh! Right? You were on the on the priority list here. That's oh, I'd never even considered yeah. that. Yeah. So so right now, just today, the government says we can. You know, yesterday we could start registering if we're lucky. By the end of the month, you know, one might get a vaccination. Right. Now, 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 you got to understand that by virtue of being a citizen in the north, you have privilege. Right. You have privilege compared to folks in the south. Right. Even though you have many injustices that you have to deal with as a result of being a person of color in a racist society, right? And so, so it's complicated, but it, it shouldn't be something, you see that my, my, my hope and prayer basically is that we can talk about power differentials as adults, as, as grown-ups, not personalize it and so on. Understand that what we're dealing here with is a systemic problem. Not that, you know, Mariam is bad and Kumi is good or whatever. You know what I mean? We have to understand it as a systemic problem. And, and, what, and I'm so glad, Mariam, you asked this question, right? Because I do think, by the way, this is many people of color, right? In, who live in the global north, um, especially those who are middle class, do carry some measure of sort of guilt and anxiety about, you know, if they're getting on well and they got no issues in the society. But, but let's just be clear. The majority of people of color that live in rich countries around the world do not live a life of dignity and decent and, 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 and are not treated with the maximum decency, right? And the United States is the best example of it. And Europe is Everything that exists in the United States in terms of structural racism exists in Europe. It's just that European governments are a little bit smarter in presenting it in a somewhat slightly less crude and more palatable way. Yeah, they're a little bit older. <laughs> They've had more practice at doing yeah. it, it feels. <laughs> okay, I have, I have one last question and then we're going to move on to climate confessions. When... We, we talked about this very early on about sometimes how it can feel like we're too late. You know, we've all around this. What I wanted to ask was when you were 14, 15, doing the kind of like, a, you know, being part of the anti-apartheid struggle, did you feel optimistic? Did you feel that um, you could bring about the change? You know, we, <laughs> those with power generally want people who do not have power to believe that change is impossible, right? Nelson Mandela said, uh, 
You know, it always seems impossible until it is done. It always seems impossible until it's done, right? And, and I think that is the challenge for activism right now. And that is why, even though there's a big part of me when I look at the science and I look at extreme weather events, I am just as desperately anxious as, as other people are, right? But I'm uh, about to launch a podcast called Power People and Planet. And I've already done about six interviews. And you know, one of the things that, that I will come on, it's no problem. <laughs> you invited me. <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> uh, and, and all the interviews I've done so far, this is for the Green Economy Coalition, pushing the idea that we need a new social contract that balances equity and sustainability. And, and you know, all six of them, on the one hand, are desperately anxious about how bad the state of the world is, the crises, convergence of crises, perfect storm, boiling point, whatever you want to call it, right? On the one end. But almost all six of them also say something very optimistic. They say, we don't remember, especially the older people I've spoken to, we do not remember any moment in our history. And I would say the same where the possibilities of big structural and systemic change appears as a real possibility. Not a walk in the park, by no means a walk in the park, but a real possibility. Because you see, after the global financial crisis in 2008-2009, what we needed was, okay, what we got, let me say what we got from power, those in power, was system recovery, system protection, system maintenance. But what was needed then, and what's even more urgently needed now is system innovation, system redesign, and system transformation. Whether it's the economic system, transport system, food system, whatever, right? We need fundamental change. Because rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic right now, which is what our governments are trying to do, is too little too late. And, 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 and the way we need to do that is to ensure that we are analyzing the problems in the most honest and brutal way, right? So for example, I would say the biggest health challenge we face right now is not COVID, right? COVID is not the biggest disease we face. The biggest disease is a disease we could call affluenza, right? Affluenza is a pathological illness where so many of us have been led to believe that a good, decent life comes from acquiring more and more and more and more personal property and acquisitions, right? And unless we can do a massive flipping of that, rea that reality where people come to realize what's more important is our families, our community, our neighbors, our friends, the, 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 our health, having time to listen to music. And, and by the way, people, some people listening to this will know me well and say, what is that guy talking about? He never used to listen to music. He never seen him <laughs> dancer. But I've come, I've gone full circle and, and, and I've looked at the world and I'm like, what moves people? Right? What moves people? And we have to speak to people's emotions. And, and let me just tell you a very simple thing. Right? Let's play a quick uh, experiment. Today, the task of activism is to build a bridge to those that don't agree with us. And it's our responsibility to harness the creativity and the skill to help people walk across onto the side of decency, inclusivity, anti-racism, and a fair and just economic system that protects our climate. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. Okay. So by this point in the podcast, everyone knows what Climate Confessions is. So should we just go straight into it? Yeah, let's do it. Kumi, what, what have you brought to the table this week? <laughs> what have you got for us, Kumi? <laughs> well, I have a long list, actually. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's good to know. So I'm, I'm, um, so I'm find myself in Durban as a result of an uncle of mine passing and and I, I'm normally in Joburg, and so I'm down here, and then COVID's got me stuck here. 
uh, and um, and uh, I've you know with my double masks and shields and so on, I have to visit some of my aunties and relatives and so on, and I tell them I'm seriously now vegetarian and uh and and i'm but, but because i have to go because if i go i have to have a meal <laughs> i can't not eat right because it's culturally like kubi tell us the confession the confession is, have to give us the justification the confession is when i go to my auntie's house and my aunties say yeah you're vegetarian but you know you haven't seen you so long and we cook the favorite dish that you used to I used to cook for you 25 years ago before you went to exile, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I got to confess that I'm still, you know, uh, maintaining my vegetarianism and when I can control it. But I, I got to confess that I, I, I find it very hard to say no to my, <laughs> to, to my elders. And uh, I would be lying to you that on the few occasions that I fell off the wagon as a day, <laughs> that I, I I would be lying if I said, oh, I really hated it. <laughs> because, uh, because to be honest, it did, does bring back, food does bring back memories of childhood. Yeah. I lost my mom when I was very young and so on. So like, that's what one of my aunts did. She said, ah, oh, this was the favorite dish your mother used to cook. Right. Oh, and, and when I saw that, I, I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm having that. But, uh, but my second confession, you'll only want no, one. I mean, Is that enough? Go you ahead. No, you no, can no, take no. one of our slots. That's good. <laughs> take mine. Be my guest. Oh, you mean you're also going to do, uh, I didn't know that, but okay. So this is going to shock and disappoint a lot. We're of looking people. forward to it. <laughs> I don't know why it makes me so happy. This is, I've got to work this out in myself. This is not a good thing. Okay. okay. So the good thing is I don't own a car, but I do own a motorbike. Okay. And, and, uh, and, uh, being on a motorbike has been really good for my health because, uh, I, a friend of mine introduced me to this when I was, uh, diagnosed with the uh, severe hypertension. And when I'm on a motorbike, having started when I was like in my forties, when I'm on the motorbike, I'm not thinking about climate change, poverty, inequality. All I'm thinking about, how the hell do I stay on the thing and don't <laughs> come off? Yeah. So I'm concentrating on one thing and it's been really good for a mind that usually has got 50 things running in it. Just constantly. Right. Running. So as I started, um, you know, getting into my bike, some, but six years ago, uh, my friend Clive, who's the one who introduced me to biking, introduced me to MotoGP. So my favorite sport right now is probably one of the most politically incorrect sports, which I watch, which is, uh, you know, guys on motorbikes going round and round. And I'm sure people who are not into it think, what oh, the hell, they just go round in circles. So, so if I do find time to watch uh, sports, in a particular way, find it hard yeah. to change, you know, uh, and, and, and that's the challenge of the moment for all of us. And I think this climate confessions is a really good way to end this segment because it's not about, and I, and I, I see what you're doing. You're not about sort of accusing people for being bad, but actually saying this is a very complex, messy way. All of us are going to have our journeys to getting to the other side and it's okay if we're not perfect, because nobody is perfect, right? Uh, it doesn't mean to be part of the climate movement. You have to, you know, absolutely have a zero carbon footprint, right? If you can, that's great. And, and for, and, and, and in a way, being a climate activist, in a way, is like a man trying to be a good feminist, right? Because, you know, as somebody who's been in the feminist movement for a long time, I see it as a journey. I, I'm never going to be at a point where I think I've arrived, that I've dealt with all the decades and decades of, uh, you know, how masculinity is constructed and all the sexist kind of socialization one went through, right? But if you see it as a journey and you see it as work, I have to continue to work, which is how I see things around, you know, 
uh, trying to be a good feminist, in the same way, I think a, a climate activist also has to go through the journey of trying to recognize that we will we will have a lot of contradictions. And some of the contradictions, to be clear, is outside of our control. All of us, if we own cars, would like to be in electric cars. And electric cars that don't get uh, the cobalt and lithium and so on, with people being children having to die in the mines in Democratic Republic of Congo so that people in Europe can drive electric cars and feel very nice about themselves, right? So all of us would like to have electric cars that are don't have human rights violations in them, but they don't exist. So if you are driving a normal car right now, you know, and, and using fossil fuels, I don't think you should, people should see that as completely your fault, right? Uh, and provided you are using your voice to say, we want cleaner transportation and so on, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's okay. It's okay not to be uh, to, to be uh, flawed because all of us are flawed. And 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 if I can go back to where we started, if is if ons is deep in the cock, right? <laughs> it's going to be quite a shitty way of actually getting out of the shit that we're in, and it's it's going to be messy and it's not going to be perfect. And I put up my hand and say, you know, like. I believe many people in the world, you know, live with many weaknesses, many contradictions, and so on. I think, though, the challenge for us is try to acknowledge it. And, and that's what I've tried to do in this conversation with you. I try to say that actually, you know, I've served organizations out of, you know, out of goodwill and, and tried my best. Uh, I don't believe I succeeded to make the changes on the scale that was needed by those organizations or what I went into those organizations trying to do. And in that sense, I'm saying I failed. Right. And I think it's better to say we have failed, pick ourselves up and see whether there's a different way we can do things so that we can be more successful rather than digging our heads in the ground and saying we great, we great, we great, we great, which is sometimes what some organizations tend to do. I I would like us to end there actually because I think that that's you've just done such a amazing it was just that a was perfect, a perfect outro. Outro. <laughs> it's just such an amazing explanation yeah. of what even climate confessions is about so I I don't I don't want to pollute it with ours I would like to say one last thing which is just that just a thank you Kumi for joining us and for being honest and vulnerable and funny and real <laughs> and sharing that experience with everyone. There's so many things that I take away from this conversation that I haven't heard before and that feel really valuable in helping us to keep fighting, like you said. So I, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you, Ben, for having me. I hope your listeners find something useful in what I said. Thank you. Yeah, screw them. Even if they don't, I did six. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> don't worry about it. It hasn't been a waste of time. Thank you so much, man. Okay, take yeah. care. Massive thanks to Kumi for sharing his wisdom and incredible stories on how we can address the inequalities and the differentials of power that exist in the world today, and not just in climate and the climate space, but across politics, business, activism, education, all, all these things. Ben, we know this has been an epic two-part conversation. I am right. Right. feeling in a reflective mood and I'm right, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> a There's lot a to, lot reflect, to on. reflect on. There is a lot um, to reflect I hope, on. I hope everyone listening also feels like they can just take a minute and really absorb everything they've heard. But but Ben I have to ask you, what is really what is really sticking with you from everything you've heard? Do you know what? I think the big thing for me is a, a pretty running theme actually from both seasons of this podcast now that if you are somebody who's a singer if you're a dancer if you're a writer if you can tiktok no matter what you're doing whatever it is that you can do you have as much power um as the head of any huge organization right and i think that this idea of like 
how people are able to communicate with people um, in languages that they understand is so so important um, and I, th- I I feel like it's really empowering like I feel like whenever we speak to someone who is like the one of the leaders of this like global movement um, for climate change or, or for climate activism um, and they give the power like straight back to us and give the power straight back to the people I always feel so encouraged by that um, so I think that that's, that's a, a really important thing especially for the artists who might be listening people who are creative um, and maybe feel like they can't find their space in this conversation like you are really really important and we need more songs we need more shows we need all of that kind of stuff so that these messages are being disseminated to, to everybody what what is your big takeaway so I love that message too because I think yeah sometimes it feels like oh do I have the right skills to be involved and I think what I'm hearing, like you've said from so many people is, yeah, um, any skills are the right skills. But, you know, the thing that really, the, the thing that really stuck with me and that I feel like has come up in, in conversations again and again is this idea that people feel like it's too late. And I totally, totally get that energy. Like I totally get that feeling. You know, I, I'm, I'm definitely have been, feeling that sometimes myself but I do actually listening to someone like Kumi and listening to like him talk about the work and knowing that he's out there talking to all these different groups you know he sees this world in a certain way the idea that actually maybe we actually have just enough time to act and that if we act now there are things that we can still save and there are things that we can do and but I have to say the other part of what he said that I absolutely love is that even if it is too late for some things, I want to go down fighting. And that really speaks to me. Like, you know, whether you're fighting for, like, you know, whether you're fighting to save something like, you know, certain certain species or certain ecosystems or whether you're fighting to bring, like, a just transition or whether you're even fighting just to hold key people accountable, there's something really empowering to say, like, regardless of what, the final outcome is we've got to keep fighting. We can't just sit down. You know, we can't take the sitting down. I don't know. I, I find that really encouraging. Um, probably because I'm a bit <laughs> oppositional in nature. So, so I'm up for a good fight, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's what really stuck with me. Um, I, I just, I want to, I want to say thank you to everyone listening who stuck with us in our first two parter. We've got, a couple of more special things happening for you this season so so keep listening and oh and stay curious <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this week we really hope you enjoyed this episode if you did please rate subscribe and share this episode with a curious friend it makes us possible to keep making this amazing content for you oh and slide into our dms at tedx london and let us know which climate extraordinaires you'd love to hear from next time oh and don't leave yet we wanted to tell you a bit more about who made this podcast possible yeah we did tedx london's headline partner city has been supporting us for the past five years to bring world-changing ideas to the tedx london stage and now they're taking it to the next level by making this podcast possible. Thanks, City. But wait, that is not all. No, this podcast was produced by the amazing Josie Coulter. Curation and research by the genius Tara Cooper. Artwork designed by the visionaries that are Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Mingus. Mixed and engineered by the iconic Ben Beheshti, a.k.a. The Falcon, who also composed our banging theme tune. Presented by me, Marion Pasha. And by me, Ben Hurst. Stay curious.